This is amazing. I don't think I've ever heard that story of someone who's gone to like this much effort and time and money. I think that's also why it didn't work. You're trying to figure out how to build this from zero with really no money. It took me a while to not be offended when somebody said no. You just hear no, 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 and you're like, I'm doing everything wrong. It's now an ed tech unicorn. And to this day, that was a really good decision. Learned a lot. People smell desperation or fear. Not quite the perfect CD. Not really what we're looking for. Kind of, but not really, right? There was always a better candidate trying to overcome this. You need a warm introduction. Now I look for that in founders when I evaluate startups for investment. If the founders are really committed, a good VC should always be there as a sounding board to help you. From corporate life in London to entrepreneurship in Germany and then an MBA in Singapore and Paris, Mona Teasler is now full-time venture capitalist working for Tokentus as a Web3 investor. Mona, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here. I cannot wait to get stuck into your career trajectory because, I mean, it's been all of the things, right? You've had both the corporate, the entrepreneurship, but it's also taking you across all these different countries. So where should we begin? Good question. It's definitely been a journey. Yeah. It's definitely been a journey. So you did study in Scotland at St. Andrews, which is so cool. Where did you, what did you study? Sorry. Yeah, I studied uh, management and psychology oh, as a double major. Amazing. So um, back then I didn't really know why. I just enjoyed those subjects. Now I think it's actually a really good combo. I was just thinking that they actually sound really useful, really interesting. And, you know, most people at that age don't know what they want to do, obviously. So it's kind of like, oh, just, you know, where's my friend signing up? So that sounds, that sounds really cool. And then from there, so you went from, to so originally from Germany, went to Scotland and then in, and then down to London to start your career properly, your professional journey, which was in management consulting. Is that correct? So you worked for these big guys. And then from there is when you went, you made that leap into entrepreneurship, right? So talk us through that story. What was your startup? Yeah, um, perfect summary there. Um, yeah, my, my journey initially four years as a management consultant was a really good start. Um, but I really wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. And I got a great opportunity to go back to Germany and launch and grow the German entity of an education technology startup that had actually had been originally founded in New Zealand. Oh, wow. Okay. So <laughs> it was just to throw another country just, in the mix. Just to make it a little bit more international. Um, it was really a cold outreach on LinkedIn. Wow. And I just thought, you know, this sounds like an amazing challenge. Wow. Let's jump in the deep end. As in them to you, cold outreach. Mm -hmm. so they headhunted you to go and launch this side of the ed tech business in Germany from New Zealand. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay, exactly. Wow. So you were like general manager or country manager for that entity. Okay. Exactly. I, I founded uh, or, yeah, even um, registered the German entity and then grew that entity mm. um, and was in charge of, you know, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. And uh, it was a really, really exciting journey, you know, because even though I didn't do the product building, I really learned a lot about market entry, about hiring staff, about building a offering that is actually originally targeting a completely different market. So mm. it was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. What's really interesting about that opportunity is it sounds as though it's the closest that you could ever get to launching and building your own company without it fully being, you know, your own baby that you came up with initially, right? Because you're still, you're setting up in a whole new country, you mentioned market entry, you're just, you're taking something that's someone else has thought of and it works somewhere else, but everything else is on you basically. So it's like 99.9% .9 entrepreneurship. <laughs> that's honestly how I felt as yeah. well. I was like, this is great. It's like, taking the leap to be an entrepreneur, but with a little less risk. Yeah. And so I just thought it was like a real life MBA in my thought process at mm. the time. So I just said, awesome, let's do it. Let's let's try this. And I, to this day, think that was a really good decision. Yeah. And I really, really learned 
a lot. I bet you did. It must have been absolutely night and day compared to your <laughs> life in corporate, right? Yeah, it was. It was from the topic because all of a sudden I was dealing with younger students, teachers, parents, um, educational institutions, and, you know, hiring a workforce that was very different from the people that I had worked with in consulting, right? Different backgrounds, different growth trajectory, ideas about their career. So it was really challenging because you learned so much about yourself by having to tailor a product, an offering to a customer segment, to, you know, a completely different group of people before you were dealing with, you know, executives and big companies mm. um, and making slides perfect and mm. every line was perfectly aligned with the next line. And here it was more about, look, we need to build something fast. We need to get the right people on board. We need to do the right sales, the right marketing and make revenues. Mm. So it was a great challenge. What were some of the key differences that you experienced compared to your previous role in corporate versus the ad tech startup? It was really that in the management consulting business, my role was always different industries, different projects, different clients, and also different team compositions. Here, it was, you're starting really small, right? You're doing all the admin yourself. You're really trying to figure out how to manage and build this from zero with really no money mm. and you're dealing with a completely different customer segment you have to learn how to sell and you have to learn how to market mm. and um, you're not dealing with executives or you know people that want consultants to support maybe a big digital transformation but you're dealing with teachers who might want to support their students better or students who want to get support for going to Harvard or Stanford because the edtech business was an admissions consultancy. Mm -hmm. So it was really a complete, everything was different, yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm just imagining it. What were some of the biggest like shocks to the system? What were the biggest challenges? You mentioned that you didn't really have any money building this thing, but and yet you've got to do you build something out of nothing. You mentioned about kind of sales and marketing and it sounds as though you didn't really have as much of that experience before the ed tech. And then of course you've got a completely different audience. You've got something in New Zealand. Does it necessarily translate over to Germany? Like I'm, I'm already just imagining <laughs> all of the potential challenges. What were some of the biggest like shocks to the system for you in that transition? I think from being supported with amazing colleagues that have so much knowledge and hustle and grit to being all alone, you know, in a country that I hadn't lived for quite a while because I, you know, for nine years I was in the UK. So I came back and I didn't actually know how Germany worked really. And so it was quite a challenge, even the language, even though my native language is German, to work in German mm. was actually quite challenging. And the biggest challenge was definitely the sales wow. because you really, in order to survive, in order to build this company, in order to be able to hire people to help you, to work with you, to be on this trajectory with you, you needed to make enough revenue to pay their salaries and the insurance and all these things, right? So you went out and you were like, how do I sell, right? How, how does this actually work? And so it took me a while to figure out also to not be offended when somebody said no, mm. right? Because it was like, it's quite a hard lesson to learn, at least for me, yeah. when you, you know, put your heart and soul into it and you're super nervous and you're like, look, this is a really great opportunity. This is a really strong, you know, support network that you're buying into. And you just hear no, no, no. And you're like, I'm doing everything wrong. Do you realize, no, it's maybe just not the right product or right project for them. It has nothing to do with your personality. Um, or maybe it's just a different messaging you need. That's such a huge life lesson. And I feel like there's there's no shortcut to experience and you have to go through those rejections to thicken up your skin. Yeah. Um, it's really funny that you say that. I believe that all kids should spend a summer, I think when you kind of between high school or before you go to uni or maybe the first year of uni, I feel like if I were queen of the world, I'd get every young person to do like a summer, a summer holiday 
just a short stint working in like hospitality, working in like a bar or waitressing, Mm -hmm. the amount of stuff that that teaches you, the life sort of stuff, you know, sales, yes, as well as uh, new customer service and multitasking and a bunch of other things. But um, it sounds as though, you know, it would have been nice to maybe have that add on sales to your management and psychology course at uni, right? I agree. Sales is such a life skill. Like, I feel like we all need it. So how did you kind of brush up on that skill that you felt was lacking? Again, we're still in this era of your ed tech kind of startup in Germany. So that was, you said, that was the biggest shock to the system, biggest challenge. How did you overcome it? Did you just kind of throw yourself in the deep end and just kept picking yourself back up again or? Yeah, it was a (laughs) multi-strategy, I would say. In hindsight, right? In hindsight, (laughs) yes. On one hand, um, I also learned to reach out to the original founders of this startup and the New Zealand team. And I was like, how do you do it? Can you maybe help me a little bit and coach me how you, even if it's a different market, but how do you actually speak to, you know, your market participants, the people that you sell to? And that helped me a bit because I was like, ah, right, that's actually a very good way of phrasing something that took me a really long time to get across. Right. And um, I also looked at my network and I just reached out to a few people on LinkedIn um, that I thought could be mentors. Mm. And I just asked for, you know, an hour of their time and tried to see, you know, what learnings or what tricks or like little little bits and bobs they could give me nuggets of wisdom yeah um, have any of those stuck with you because I feel like our listeners really love those like those little nuggets of wisdom those little practical tips can you remember any however small just like anything practical that you remember from that time that helped you with sales so one of the things I do remember is that people smell desperation or fear yeah yeah that's a big one and the more you are relaxed and don't put, you know, have this nervous energy, the more likely it is that the person will listen to you, Mm -hmm. that they will actually really think about what you're offering because otherwise it gives an not a good feeling, Mm -hmm. right, to the person that you're talking to. And they, it just makes the whole conversation a little bit awkward. Right. And once I kind of thought, okay, be calm, smile, you know, if if this doesn't work, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Once I had that more of a calm approach, things went a lot smoother. Mm. And I actually was able to strategize much more and had much more brain capacity to think things through rather than worrying so much about not being good at sales. Mm, interesting. I love how this links back to your psychology course as well, almost, right? Because it's yeah. the uh, it's the power dynamics. It's like no, no, no one wants to be sold to. Like even salespeople, like nobody wants yeah. to be sold to. And the whole kind of salesperson, even the job title, like the job title doesn't exist anymore. We've all yeah. got business development executives, customer success, like yeah. SDR, but it's like, it's become such a dirty word because of bad salespeople. And it's exactly as you say, it's that desperation, it's the it's the chasing, it's just annoying. It's just yeah. a nigging, niggling, nagging, annoying thing. So yeah, I totally agree with you on that one. All right, yeah. love, love that tip. Okay, so moving on. So how many years were you working for this ed tech startup in Germany? So full-time, two years. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually, until last year, still owned the entity until it was acquired by the UK entity that had by then become a very large entity dealing with the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. So it was just a natural merge Mm -hmm. or kind of like a mini acquisition. Right. And um, did they buy your shares? Yes. Congratulations. Yes. So that was nice. So in the end, that kind of worked out for me in that way quite well. And um, it also worked out, I think, for the overall management of a now very global company. It is now an EdTech unicorn um, based on New Zealand standards, so in New Zealand dollars, <laughs> um, which is amazing because the founders are absolutely, you know, incredible. 
So they really deserve to, you know, get that unicorn status oh, for their company because they worked so hard to Fantastic. get there. Fantastic. So deserving. I love that. So you're there two years full time. And then are we yes. coming on to your MBA at this point? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, before we get into that, I know that you said to me before, this was, you took this decision like very strategically you knew what you wanted to do afterwards. So we're kind of leapfrogging ahead a little bit because you knew that you wanted to go into venture capital. Is that correct? That is right. And you knew that kind of you, these were the steps you needed to do in order to achieve that. So I love that strategic thinking of yours, obviously trained management consultant there, which is excellent. Um, but so first of all, why did you want to go into VC? How did you know that that was the thing you wanted to do? Because obviously taking out that much time and money mm -hmm. to do the MBA is a big decision. So you're placing your bets on, on that. So how did you know if VC was the route for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I was really searching for the right path. And I did that by looking at what I enjoyed during my management consulting years and what I enjoyed during my venture building or growth uh, market entry days. And I identified the following points. Number one, I liked the project-based work. I liked working with different teams, different people, and I liked having to think about different industries. Um, that was the management consulting side. And then from the more entrepreneurial aspects, I really enjoyed building something young from the ground up and really thinking about go-to-market strategies and hiring and the right path, roadmap. So what brings those two things together? And after a little bit of research and talking to people in my network, I realized venture capital. Mm. Because it is project-based, it is research-heavy, it is very working with different teams, mm. right? Different, different challenges. But it is also very entrepreneurial because if you do early-stage investing, you're working with early-stage companies that might need your support, your knowledge, and you can problem solve with them mm, help them grow so can I just ask that period of self-reflection that you describe you were like what did I love about this what did I love about that was that just like you on your own just taking that time to reflect or was it working with a coach did you seek out like a careers consultant just while we're still in that kind of taking your mind back to those earlier exploratory days I didn't use a career consultant. I did do this on my own. I think I think the psychology background mm. and frameworks I learned did help me okay. because you know you naturally are open to yeah. these kind of frameworks and thought processes that help you navigate a little bit through what do I actually want and need and what are my real skills. But I would always say if that's not something that comes super natural to you, then using a career coach is actually very, very helpful. I have many friends who did that, you know, in different times of their lives, somewhere between 18 and 45. And I think most of them really made a massive positive change because of their career mm. coach. The reason I ask is I know if I'm just left alone in a room to just think, <laughs> I just feel it does work for some people, yeah. maybe more so those who studied psychology. So I'm very <laughs> happy to hear that a university degree actually came in ha handy to someone. Um, but I just won't get anywhere. I'll just kind of, I'll just circle in my own mind. So I definitely need to get it out. I know for some people it's journaling, it's getting it all out on the page, writing it down. For me, surprise, surprise, as a podcast host, I need to talk, I need to get it out of my system. So that's that's just why I'm curious. Okay, amazing. So you took that time of self-reflection, your psychology frameworks came in handy there. You came to that realization, actually VC could be the answer. I'm going to speak to some people. And then through those conversations, it was kind of a fact-finding mission for you, right, to then lead up to taking the MBA. So what was the feedback from the people that you spoke to at this point in time? Yes, the feedback from people I spoke to and also companies that I applied to, which were all the way from kind of accelerator to pure venture capital funds, was always like, look, not quite the perfect CV, not really what we're looking for, kind of, but not really. And the feedback I received was a lot like, look, you did consulting, but you didn't really work in financial services consulting, so you don't really have that financial services background. 
you did do entrepreneurship, but it wasn't your own startup. You didn't found it. You didn't build the product. You didn't fundraise for it. So mm, also not quite the entrepreneurial you know, view or experience that we look for. So not really, right? There was always a better candidate than, than me. And the feedback was never very, very bad. It was just always like, look. Just not quite. Not quite. Yeah. So I was like... Hmm. How do I, how do I fix this? Even though that's maybe the wrong terminology, but how do I achieve my goal because it doesn't seem to be working through just sending a CV through an online application process? Mm. So I thought a little bit more, talked to more people, ask for re- uh, for a feedback. So one of the things I really learned is just to say, look, thank you for taking the time to interview me. If you took three or so rounds to speak to me, please provide me like proper feedback, mm. right? Because you sp- we both spent a lot of time in this process. Yeah. And then the feedback was like, look, do something like an MBA or um, something in relation to get your financial services knowledge up to par to be a better candidate. And I was like, okay. It's actually helpful. It <laughs> like is helpful. something I can actually action. Exactly. So I was like, okay, and that's something that makes sense. So I ended up Applying for INSEAD, I chose INSEAD as an MBA university because it's only a year. So it was a bit shorter and the average age was around my average age at the time. So it just made sense for me. It Mm -hmm. seemed like the right fit. Luckily, I managed to get in and um, did my journey then in Singapore and in Fontainebleau, which is close to Paris, and uh, did a variety of different things during the MBA to still get my profile up to, you know, par for a VC because wow. even after the MBA and I graduated during the pandemic, I still struggled a little bit with wow. the VC stuff. So what were some of the other things that you were doing to improve your chances? So firstly, I did an internship wow. with a, a B2B deep tech fund in Singapore. Then I also was told, look, you don't really have entrepreneurial experience which now I like to beg to differ. (laughs) But uh, I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to think of something and I'm going to found a startup. So that's when my actual personally co-founded startup came into being, which is a food tech click and collect marketplace. And I was like, okay, I'm going to really learn how to fundraise. I'm going to really learn how to do this and hopefully make something out of this. And this whole time, this is still with the end goal in mind, right? Of getting into VC. Yes. This is amazing. I don't think I've ever heard that story of someone who's, I mean, definitely not someone who's gone to like this much effort and time and money and everything else. Or, you know, not only an MBA, but also it's taking you across the other side of the world to do this in Singapore. You're doing internships in the meantime as well. And I just think it is, it's so fascinating to then go and like, set up a business almost as a almost as like an interview task right (laughs) it's like I'm going to prove to you (laughs) I can like I do have that entrepreneurial um vein in me so I'm going to show I can imagine that that must have led you to have a much healthier mindset than most are than the vast majority of other entrepreneurs who go and set up their businesses. Because if you what I'm imagining do of course correct me if I'm wrong but having a bit of that mental separation and treating it more as like it's another rung on the ladder to help me achieve that next goal you haven't got as much of that that ownership that territorialness that emotion that other founder where they're like no this is the end goal for me right you're treating it more as an interview task would you say do you think that's fair to say Yes, but I think that's also why it didn't work. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, that was going to be my next question. I wonder. Okay. Yeah, so I had a co-founder who was more of an operational day-to-day co-founder, which obviously very important. I was more the strategic, the financial, the fundraise, the go-to-market planner, not so much the executor. Um, But I strongly believe and now I look for that in founders when I evaluate startups for investment if the founders are really committed and if they do have that ownership interesting because I didn't and Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the major reasons why that startup never flourished to the extent that I still to this day believe it could have 
And um, that's actually a real shame. Wow, interesting. Well, kudos to you for recognizing that and, you know, admitting it, so to speak. So, so you'd say then that, like, because you did not have, like, the, I'm going to, like, die by, like, this is what, this is my life's mission, this is what I was put on the earth for, because you didn't have that level of commitment, you think that was one of the reasons that it failed, ultimately? I would say so, yes. Wow, okay. Do you think there are any other reasons that contributed to really difficult time to start a click and collect marketplace when there's a pandemic going on and you're not allowed to have any (laughs) in-person interaction. Um, The reason for that being because, you know, delivery services take a really, really high percentage of the restaurant's um, revenue and it was just a way to reduce it and it was also a focus on food waste reduction. Mm. So I think the mission was something I still very much stand behind. It was just a really bad time to Mm. think about launching this. And then it took a really long time to really get off the ground. And, um, but I definitely think that that's, that's a, let's say macro factor, but the real strong or main reason I think is if you're not a hundred percent committed to something, why would anybody give you a lot of money um, to to grow it if if your if your heart's not in it it doesn't mm. make any sense yeah interesting so how far did you manage to take this business so we did uh, raise about hundred fifty thousand and a kind of pre seed round mm. um, we did launch in Nottingham in the UK because we wanted to not be in competitive London but we wanted to be more in the Midlands and then expand into Scotland. And maybe be an interesting target for a larger player to acquire us down the line Mm. who maybe started in London and doesn't want to expand themselves into that area. That was kind of the strategic plan. I was just going to say, always strategically thinking. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, I didn't really manage to, we didn't get to manage to onboard so many restaurants. Um, I wasn't on the ground. I think we had a little bit of trouble with the sales and so, um, yeah, I think that was, but the, the company is still alive. Mm. It's just a very small business. Mm. Well, kudos to you. I'm so impressed. I mean, the fact that you still, I think success, failure, everyone's got their own definitions. It's all subjective, but I love that you are able to kind of step back and, and kind of assess what happened, where it went wrong and, and use it for that next step. So we now get towards you kind of <laughs> achieving your, your final goal here. So you've eventually got into VC, so congratulations. Is it everything that it lived up to be? <laughs> I have to say, people told me, why are you doing so much work? It's not going to be what you expected. And I was like, I know it's going to be what I expected. And I can really say it is what I thought it would be, and I'm super happy. That's exactly my feelings with the Barbie movie. Everyone (laughs) was like, Steph, you're getting so hyped up. And I'm like, no, it actually is great. (laughs) There we go. Perfect. (laughs) So I totally relate. I can completely empathize. Well, no, mate, I'm really happy for you. That's fantastic. So you're now at Tokenta. So you mentioned before, um, you know, what you now look for in a founder. So obviously I was going to come on to that as well. So if it's mainly entrepreneurs that are listening to this, whether they're thinking of setting up something or they're Mm. in the early days or they're kind of going through that fundraise at the moment. A, it's just so fascinating. I just love that you've been through this journey of employment, entrepreneurship, education, and now you're seeing things from the other side of the fence. So what, okay, so first of all, what can listeners take away from your advice from the VC side of the fence You mentioned before you look for founders who have got that strong commitment. What else is it that you look for? Strong commitment, just to repeat that point. Mm. Also, the strong commitment spills over into, for example, standing behind your product and being proud of it, right? Because then sales are also much easier because you're really so, you believe in it, right? It's not selling something. It's just expressing your enthusiasm for your venture baby. And I think that's, I need to see that. I need to feel that. Also, generally, I think team overall is really important. So are you as a founder equipped for this business or have you gotten the right team members around you that are maybe more technical or have, you know, other aspects in terms of expertise needed to do whatever you're trying to achieve? Maybe it's a very technical solution. So make sure you have the right people in the team to have that background. Um, 
and complementary skill sets. And also, I think in general, can you potentially pivot, right? Because a lot of the time we all know things very rarely go in a straight line and the journey of entrepreneurship is more like a squiggly line up and down circles left and right and can you maneuver and manage this and never get discouraged and if I see those traits in a founder also based on my own feelings and experiences I've gone through then I think you know what let's give this a try and I'll do my very best to also support with, you know, my experience, my knowledge, my network to help navigate some of those ups and downs, turns and swivels on the way. Amazing. So how many years have you been full time in VC now? Now two years. OK, congratulations. Yes. Yay. <laughs> and the reason I ask is, have you noticed any patterns or trends during that time at all? I mean, it's been a bit, a bit of a weird two years as well. So it's a funny time. But within that window, have there been any like commonalities or things that have come up over and over or something that you wish you could say to fans that like, don't do this? Like, So to put it into context, I work in the Web3 space, right? So I mainly look at blockchain technology startups. So, of course, that twists this answer maybe a little bit. So mm -hmm. please just keep that in mind. But... Um, I would say when the market is up, so meaning there's a lot of money in the market, right? Venture capitalists have a lot of money to give to startups and startups have an easier time raising for their venture. Um, it's very important to keep in mind that market downturns might come and they might or probably will come faster than you expect. So making sure that, you know, you check your runway making sure that you kind of diversify how you manage potential plan A's, plan B's, plan C's, um, that you, again, hire the right people, that you have a good strategy and think through your roadmap mm. in a realistic way. I think that's something that I think is very, very important. And I would like to make sure people think, really think about it because it's one thing to present a nice slide to a VC to get investment. And it's another thing to feel confident about being able to maneuver through bad times. Mm, fantastic. That's really helpful. Thank you for sharing some of that. What I'm curious about is on the runway piece. It's so funny because I have been in the space for the best part of... 10 years now and I've been around to see a recession come and go a couple of times and I'm really paying attention to the patterns and it's really funny how even like the keywords that come up you know now I've, I've never heard runway being spoken about so much whereas mm -hmm. pre I don't know 2021 <laughs> yeah. a runway was something that the plane landed on you know so it's it's really yeah. funny how it's we've been through such a humongous shift again obviously you've got that yeah. context of web3 particular industry particular sector of course there's all these other micro factors but very very broadly speaking it's like we had this era before of aggressive growth hacking growth at all costs gain market share worry about monetization afterwards and now it's, you know, runway, runway, how's your runway looking? We need 24 <laughs> months, blah, blah, blah. So what I wonder is, like, from your perspective as a, as a full-time VC, and of course all of your other amazing rich experience you bring to the table, is what advice can you give to entrepreneurs in terms of balancing that runway and having that more cautious, okay, we've got 24 months in the bank, we've got the buffer, we know we'll still be around, versus there are opportunities that we can jump on. There's maybe a certain hire, some a talent that we want to bring on that's, you know, demanding the salary or maybe a bigger marketing campaign so we can get more market share. What would be your advice on that? Again, I would say be willing to pivot, right? I mean, having that plan A, plan B, plan C, I think is important. Having flexibility in your mind I would say if there is opportunity for growth, for innovation, then why not go for it? But if there is no opportunity, um, then think about, okay, how can you create opportunity? However, of course, don't spend all your money because, you know, there's too much opportunity and you can't streamline your, you know, your, your priorities. Mm. That's also not good. So it's finding that balance, thinking it through, but also being able to say, okay, look, we might have 
shortened our runway. Now the situation looks a little bit less good than we expected. So what can we do to keep this company alive? Don't get discouraged. Keep on fighting and ask your VC. If you have a VC, a good VC should always be there as a sounding board, as a friend to help you. I hope you trust them, right, to ask those questions. Otherwise, mentors, other founders that have gone through this who can maybe help and navigate a little bit. Amazing. Mona, you make me feel like if I if I were ever raising investment, I'd want you on my, <laughs> in my corner. <laughs> um, the time is absolutely flying. I feel like I could talk so much more and ask you more questions about the whole investor VC landscape, but we're going to have to move things along. So I do want to touch on your the work that you're also doing, because mm-hmm. obviously you do not sit still and <laughs> obviously very hardworking, ambitious women. Um, you're also doing a lot of um, initiatives in the gender equality space. So obviously as a women in VC, women in tech, in Web3, you know, we're still the minority. So what are you what are you doing with some of those gender initiatives? So in terms of women in VC, I'm trying to create a safe space in terms of a group and regular meetups for women in VC in the in London specifically right now. Hopefully we can expand that a little bit um, to be able to share deal flow, to ask questions, which might not be as easy to ask in some of the office spaces, um, just because it's often very male dominated, specifically in this tech and also Web3 space. Um, I'm also trying to encourage female founders to take the jump, learn about blockchain, see if they might enjoy this industry, because there is so much opportunity. In my opinion, it's really, really innovative, fantastic place to be. So providing spaces and regular meetups for founders and investors to have a conversation that is not driven by any agenda, I think is really what I'm trying to do. And then also um, not yet launched, but working on an initiative that will hopefully be valuable to any underrepresented founder group Uh, to provide them with an opportunity to submit their pitch decks and information about their startup and have the security that very good VCs in Europe and the UK are actually going to have a look. And if they like those, to reach out to the founders to set up a call. So basically trying to overcome this, you need a warm introduction to get into the space as a founder in this respect, but also hopefully through the women groups, also as an investor, just as a lady wanting to, or really anybody. I mean, I don't want to just say it's just for for women. I'm happy to speak to anybody about my journey and help them. But it's just the starting point, I would say, to help women get into the space, having a safe space to talk about whatever, right? Asking questions and being seen. Well done. Amazing. Have you got a working name for this yet or is that still under wraps? Yeah. So the initiative is going to be called Distributed Funding and um, the meetups are just called Web3 Ladies in VC and uh, Women in Tech UK. Amazing. All right. Well, we'll pop the links and stuff in the show notes (laughs) if anyone's interested in signing up or just finding out some more information. It sounds fantastic. Mona, everything that you're doing is is so admirable. You're making waves in the right directions and it's all very, very exciting. So well done you. Final question, tradition, our closing tradition on this podcast is what is one big strategy that's happened to you, whether it's through your entrepreneurial days or in corporate life, that's really stuck with you throughout all this time and taught you a big lesson that you'll never forget? This is called strategy and tragedy for a reason. Yes, I see. I see. Um, I think one thing that has stuck with me, if you really believe in yourself and if you really believe in your idea and what you're trying to do. May it be a job, right? May it be a startup idea. Then you can do it. I truly believe that you will be able to do it. And the strategy is to believe in yourself, to ask for help, to not get discouraged when things don't go the right way. And to learn that not everyone's going to love you, 
but that's okay. I think that's a perfect moment to mic drop with that. Mona, thank you so, so much for that. That's honestly been such a pleasure to sit down and talk with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. That was brilliant. Thank you. And thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope that you enjoyed this podcast. I hope you found some inspiration from Mona's story and learned some practical tips to apply to your own business. Please do hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out and tune in for next time.